we have Karen L. Mel, who will be presenting Tracing the Dispersal of the Baobab and then Sonia de Gisada uh, from Africa to the Indian Ocean region in the interdisciplinary approach. Good afternoon. I'm Kerry Stock at Emory University. Um, I just started there and I'm going to talk today about what I was doing previously at um, the Royal Botanic Gardens, Melbourne, and Monash University on Adansonia digitata, the African baobab. So the work that I was doing was um, interdisciplinary. So by interdisciplinary, I mean um, using, uh, working with disciplines outside of biology. So this is probably quite different to what a lot of other people here work on. So I'm going to give a bit of background on that, um, how you go about doing that, before talking about the specifics of Adansonia digitata and possibly some future directions for the interdisciplinary approach. So this sort of shows the types of data that you can use to infer plant dispersal. So most of us here would be familiar with uh, phylogenetics and population genetics um, and that you can use these for inferring um, fairly ancient plant dispersals. But if we want to look at uh, more recent dispersals, sometimes this information can't be found in the um, for using biological data sets. And we need to look to the social sciences to, to get some information here. So things like archaeology, um, you might see uh, the plant species you're interested in appear in archaeological records at the time that the trade developed between the locality where this species is indigenous and localities where it is being used by people. And then if we want to look at something even more recent, we might look at historical records uh, where, where it has actually been recorded and written that, that people were transporting plants from one place to another and trying to introduce them. So the species that I'm going to focus on today is the African baobab, um, Adansonia digitata. It's, uh, the genus Adansonia is quite an iconic species. Uh, most people will recognise that it has um, especially in its uh, centre of, um, center of endemism in Madagascar, uh, along with, yeah, so centre of endemism is in Madagascar where there is um, six species. And it also occurs in Australia, in the northwest, where it's also a dominant feature of the landscape. And in Africa, there is the species complex Adansoni digitata. Um, there's currently two recorded species Recently, uh, I'm referring to it as the Adansonia digitata species complex. Recently, there's been a new species described, um, Adansonia kilima. So most of the species complex is uh, tetraploid individuals. This Adansonia kilima is diploid. And I'm, I think probably if we look into it even further, maybe there'll be more species. So, but at this stage, I'm just going to, when I say Adansonia digitata, I mean and so you digitata sensulato, so the whole species complex. And so this species is native to mainland Africa, but it also occurs in some of the islands of the Indian Ocean and India, and there's also some populations in the Americas. The outside of Africa, they're likely to have been introduced by people. And this is what I'm trying to work out the timing and what people may have been involved. So this is just some pictures of the African baobab. Um, this uh, photo was taken in the morning. So it uh, flowers overnight. It's pollinated by bats. Um, so that sort of has that shape of hanging kind of upside down so that the bats can get into it and pollinate it. Um, Apparently it has quite a strong odour that attracts the bats, but um, my safari driver didn't want me getting close enough to do that because it would have required leaving the vehicle, which probably wasn't, I wouldn't have wanted to do either. Um, 
So this just shows the distribution of Adamsonia digitata. So that's um, native in Africa, introduced in some of these Indian Ocean Islands in India, and that's um, that I'll be looking at its introduction. So firstly, whether the introduced populations can be matched populations in the native range using genetics and inferring dispersal pathways and the timing of dispersal, and then trying to make some inferences about what people may have been involved in this dispersal pathway. So this is looking at some of the information we get from the human geography side of the project. So this was quite a big collaborative um, effort and at least two of the PIs on the project were human geographers and um, I was doing the genetic work. So the human geography looks at two different types of dispersal. So the ancient trade routes are less well known. I think more well known is the Arab and European trade between Africa and India. And a lot of it involved displacing people from Africa to India um, in the slave trade. But before this, and um, there, there's quite a bit of evidence that there was already some ongoing trade involving various African people and Indians. And a lot of work done by one of the collaborators on this project, Priya Rangan, has found several plant species that are domesticated in India that probably arrived a long time before any historical records from Africa. So now looking at the genetic analysis that I did on the Adansonia digitata, um, we had 144 trees from Africa and India um, and genotyped these using microsatellites, uh, looked for genetic clustering using structure and then after this um, tried to see which of these genetic clusters were more closely related to each other in a phylogenetic context just with some fairly simple native adjoining trees using the populations as the terminal taxa. So this is the results of structure and um, putting it into structure harvester to see how many populations we might have. So on the left is the likelihood of different K values and this peaks at around K equals 7. On the right is the method of Ivano et al. looking at delta K to see what are the most likely um, number of populations. So the most, the highest sort of sensible number of populations we could divide it into is 7. Um, I also looked at 2 and 4 but I'll show the data from 7 today. Um, so if it's divided into seven populations, we can see that there's two clusters in India and these are both different to any of the clusters that we sampled in Africa. If you look more closely at Africa, it, it, it's fairly much what you would expect based on the biogeography. The groups in purple are the, in the mountains and the other groups are more coastal or at least lowlands. There's a biogeographic breakup along the Zambezi River, and then the red sample at the top is sort of the, um, the southern limit of the Somalian biogeographic region. And you can see from this that the Indian populations are different to the Af at least any of the sampled African populations. And we also found some private alleles in there, so this could reflect a, a fairly old introduction to India. If we look at it in a phylogenetic context, we see that the two populations from India are most closely related to the Mombasa Dar es Salaam population, which, is the, which occurs on the southern limit of the Somalian biogeographic subregion. And so looking at this in terms of the human-mediated dispersal pathways, firstly, there's multiple introductions to India and the most likely source populations for these are the northern parts of East Africa. It's possible that these populations are older than the existing trees 
and the existing trees themselves are quite old. They can live for about a thousand years, which is older than some of the, the than what we think is the timing for Europeans and Arabs to have introduced them. So, so we can sort of speculate from two for two reasons that there's likely to be ancient trade routes involved. Um, one is that there appears to have been some evolution in situ because the African, uh, the Indian populations don't match any of the African populations. However, they could match an unsampled African population and we could speculate that this might be from somewhere like the, um, the Horn of Africa, so Ethiopia, that kind of region, because the most closely related thing to it that we found was the northernmost populations that we sampled. Um, but if, if it does come from this northernmost part of um, sort of the Horn of Africa kind of region, this is also more likely to be being involved in the ancient trade routes than the recent ones. So it also fits the hypothesis that the ancient trade routes were involved. So I'm just going to finish off by talking about some other uh, work that was also part of this project using the interdisciplinary approach. So um, it could also be used with invasive species and this was uh, one of the other species that was looked at in this project was um, Bekelia farnesiana, which is sort of unknown whether it's native or introduced in Australia and sort of also questions how we define native species because there's quite a lot of different time points that things could have been introduced and where you draw that cut-off line. Um, and it's also useful for people who work in the social sciences, which I guess is probably not the audience here, but um, if you have colleagues that work in the social sciences, they may, may like to use this information to look at the history of plant domestications and also um, how hunter-gatherer societies may have uh, modified the environment. And I'm almost running out of time, so I'll just move on. <laughs> quickly acknowledge the ARC for funding the project with the, and the PIs on the project, the Priya Rang and Dan Murphy and Christian Cull. The other people on this list provided samples or um, provided comments on the um, manuscripts and various other bits of advice. And I guess I should leave it open for questions now. Possibility if you've got unique uh, genetic populations in India? Yeah, well, natural. If it was natural dispersal, we'd expect it to probably be even more ancient because, it, you know, it could have happened any. These um, Amazonia digitata evolved from its nearest um, congeneric species probably several million years ago. So, Given that amount of time, if it was going to disperse there by natural means, they have expected it already to. But yeah, that is a possibility. Yeah, yeah the, the seeds are we dispersed like semen? Um, no, the fruit is kind oh. of ooh, this big. Um, it, it, it can float, so it is possible that it's dispersed. You could have got there through ocean dispersal. Um, but it's mostly dispersed by mammals that eat the fruit and then disperse the seeds. Yeah, because Ava has been dispersed all the world by wind and it's like the system to use and that sort of You mentioned that it was um, bat pollinated. Uh, is, is there any research done on um, you know, which pollinators, if they're different in India versus Africa? Or? I don't think anyone's looked at the pollinators in India. I assume there's probably different bat species there, but I'm... 